Hello, everyone. My name is Joshua Mann, and welcome to another episode of our CCC Spotlight Series. Today, I'm excited to welcome Dr. Kim Nichols. Dr. Nichols is a full member in the Department of Oncology at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital and a member of the Hematologic Malignancies Program of the St. Jude Comprehensive Cancer Center. She also serves as Director of the Division of Cancer Predisposition, a newly formed section within the larger Department of Oncology whose mission is to enhance clinical care, research, and education surrounding hereditary forms of childhood cancer. A native of New York, Dr. Nichols received a bachelor's degree in biology from Dartmouth College in 1984 and a medical degree from Duke University School of Medicine in 1989. Dr. Nichols then completed a three-year residency in pediatrics, followed by a three-year fellowship in pediatric hematolo hematology oncology at Children's Hospital of Boston and the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Dr. Nichols has published over 200 peer-reviewed manuscripts, reviews, and book chapters, and has held numerous grants from private foundations and the NIH. Dr. Nichols sits on several editorial boards, as well as national and international advisory committees. She serves as co-lead of the American Society of Pediatric Hematology Cancer Predisposition Special Interest Group. Dr. Nichols' research ranges in scope from identifying new genetic causes for cancer to understanding the factors that influence parent and child decision-making and communication around cancer genetic testing and the psychological impacts of such testing. Ultimately, her goal is to improve the quality of life and overall outcome for children and families at increased genetic risk for cancer. Dr. Nichols is the sponsoring physician for the VHL Clinical Care Center at St. Jude. Dr. Nichols, thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much, Josh. It's a real pleasure and honor to be here to speak with you and all your colleagues on Facebook. Thank you. So let's get started then. When and why did you first decide to become a doctor, particularly a pediatric oncologist? Well, I will tell you that my route to becoming a pediatric hematologist oncologist was not a straight one. It was a very twisty and winding road, but it has landed me in an occupation, you know, that I love more than anything else. So like many girls of my era, you know, I grew up riding horses and I always wanted to be a veterinarian. So for much of my young years and as an adolescent and young adult, I've had planned to go to veterinary school. Um, in preparation, you know, I worked on a large animal farm. I worked in a small animal clinic. And really it wasn't until the year between my junior and senior year in college that, um, you know, I woke up one day and I thought, gosh, there's something that just isn't quite right. You know, I'm not sure that vet school is for me. And to this day, I still can't figure out what it was that made me change my mind. But um, I called my mom and I said, mom, I'm not applying to, to vet school. You know, I'm going to take a year off. And I took a year off and I worked in a cancer research lab at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston. And, you know, Josh, that really um, lit the fire in me. I got so excited about cancer biology and trying to understand what made cancer form, what we could do to try to treat it better. And, you know, at that point, I realized that medicine and oncology were really going to be, you know, my focus. Um, it's interesting in terms of pediatric cancer. Uh, I can tell you something, you know, kind of funny, but, you know, I had a mother, she was from Germany. She was very stubborn. And my mother never listened to her doctor and she never took her medication. And I knew from the beginning that treating adults um, would be challenging for me. Um, and also at the time, you know, mind you, this was in the eighties, um, tobacco use, smoking was very common. And a lot of adult cancers were caused by, you know, habits like smoking. And I wanted to take care of patients whose cancers were not caused by bad habits. Patients where cancers developed through no fault of their own and where I could have the greatest impact. And for me, that was in pediatrics. So a long, twisty, windy road that led me to pediatric oncology, but one that has caused me um, great satisfaction over the years. Wow, that's an amazing story. So uh, what, what got you, I know you said you were interested in treating cancers that, that occurred through no fault uh, of the patient, but uh, what got you uh, interested in cancer predisposition syndromes like VHL? 
Yes, that's a, that's a good question. So I first became interested in cancer predisposition or hereditary forms of cancer as a hematology oncology fellow. And, you know, you mentioned my training earlier on, but for people in the audience who may be less familiar, you know, after you complete medical school and residency, in my case, a pediatric residency, you have to do, you know, three to five years of extra training if you want to focus on a specialized area, like in my case, oncology. Um, so I went um, and did a pediatric hematology oncology fellowship at the Dana-Farber in Boston, where I had previously done my research experience. And as part of that fellowship, you have one year in the clinic, and then you can focus two to three years on research. So I decided to go work in a research lab at um, Massachusetts General Hospital. And it was a lab that focused on cancer genetics. And this was a really, really exciting time in medicine because it's when genes like the VHL gene and the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes that caused different hereditary forms of cancer were just coming to light. It was really exciting. And while families affected by changes in these genes are relatively rare, there was a lot of excitement about the discovery of these genes because these genes are often altered in a non-hereditary way across a wide spectrum of cancers. So at the time, and even today, people are excited about studying these genes because it is hoped that you can you know, unlock the secrets of why changes in these genes alter cell growth and lead to cancer. And hopefully that information will help to develop new treatments for cancer or even ways to prevent cancer. So I, I became interested during the research portion of my hemo training working in this cancer genetics lab. You know, it, it's funny you should say that because the uh, the vision of the VHL Alliance is curing cancer through VHL. So that's, you know, exactly what mm -hmm. you're describing. Mm -hmm. uh, pretty mm -hmm. amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, what would you say are some of the more challenging and, or, and rewarding aspects of your job? Oh, that is a difficult question. Um, and I'm going to start with the rewarding aspects because I think these far outweigh the challenges. Um, and you know, the rewarding aspects, I mean, they span the gamut. Um, there is no one single most rewarding event. Um, you know, the, they, they range from things as simple as literally a thank you note or a drawing from a patient, you know, in appreciation for what we might have said or done in clinic, to knowing that um, we helped a family better understand the cancers in their family, to knowing that we may have identified a cancer and been able to treat it earlier and someone who had undergone surveillance, uh, it spans the gamut. There are so many different ways that, that I have found rewards um, through my occupation. And, you know, when I, when, I, when I think about it, I trained or my career started at a time before understanding of cancer predisposition existed. You know, there was no appreciation for doing genetic testing and monitoring. And I can think back to when I was a hematology oncology fellow and we saw patients in clinic that had advanced stage cancers, some of which could not have been cured, that I now know, you know, we would have been able to pick up earlier had we recognized the importance of genetic testing and monitoring. So for me, it's so rewarding to see how far we've come literally over the last 20 to 30 years. It makes me feel a little bit old, to be honest with you, but we've come so far. And, you know, now in terms of pediatric cancer, we know that at least, you know, one in, uh, sorry, one in 10, so 10 to 15% of children with cancer develop the disease due to an underlying genetic predisposition like VHL. Um, so I, I think that, you know, hopefully we can build upon these experiences and, and you know, further advance our understanding and treatment of, of cancers across the spectrum, you know, children and adults. So, so rewards, you know, in many different ways. Um, one of the, you know, I mean, there, there are many challenges that, that goes without saying, <laughs> you know, um, there are challenges such as, you know, I think actually there, there are always ways we can do things better. Those are the challenges. So there, there are better ways that we can educate. What you're doing through the VHL Alliance is phenomenal. How, how can we educate families um, to learn more about their condition, to take better care of themselves? Um, 
how can we educate providers um, so that they know about rare conditions like VHL and know how to make appropriate referrals, um, be it to VHL clinical care centers, the VHL Alliance or other specialists. Um, know how to better monitor for cancer, right? We're, we're getting better at that, but we still don't know 100% when is the right time to start? When is the right time to stop? What kind of monitoring do you do? When do you intervene if you see you know, a little abnormality on a scan? Um, there are still so many unanswered questions. Um, and then obviously treatment, you know, what can we do with the knowledge that we gain to better treat cancers or even to prevent them from occurring? So, you know, there are so many challenges, but each of these challenges is really an opportunity for improvement. And it's, it's what motivates us. It's what motivates me, my team here at St. Jude, um, all my colleagues in the field to try to further advance um, our knowledge and improve the outcomes for patients with hereditary forms of cancer like VHL. It's a, a very, a very noble cause. Um, <laughs> so what, uh, or I don't know if there's been one single experience, but what has been your most uh, memorable experience uh, as a VHL specialist? Oh, gosh, that gets back to, I guess, the rewards, you know, I think there are, there are too many memorable experiences um, and, and, and they, they range from, you know, the smallest to the, to the largest. Um, I think, so as not to repeat what I've already said, you know, there, there have been a number of um, memorable experiences, a couple of which, you know, uh, happened here at St. Jude uh, that are focused around maybe having special conferences for families um, focusing on cancer predisposition. Um, at St. Jude, we've held two previous family conferences. Um, they have not yet focused on VHL, but I hope we can have one focusing on VHL in the future. And at these conferences, you know, we brought together experts in the field so families could learn more about the latest research advances, more about the clinical advances. And these families could have a chance to connect with us and with experts and with one another. And, you know, I think it really opened my eyes because while I knew a lot about these conditions and I knew they existed, some of these families had never met other families with the same condition. So it was tremendously, you know, rewarding um, and memorable to see how they could connect with one another. And it also, it was so memorable for me as a provider to have time to sit down and talk with these families one-on-one. -on -one. You know, when we're in the clinic, we're so busy, right? We're constantly rushing. We don't want to be late for the next patient. We're thinking about our notes and the next thing, and, and we don't have time to connect either. So I think that, you know, having conferences like this is, is so important and so memorable. And Josh, I'd love to work with you in the future to see if we could have one focused on VHL. But I think these really are some of the most memorable experiences that I've had recently that relate to cancer predisposition. Absolutely. I, I, I look forward to working with you on, on such a mm -hmm. conference. And, uh, and I'll say that uh, we uh, very, very frequently um, get comments like I've never met uh, another person outside my family with VHL. So it's mm -hmm. uh, when you're go especially going through a, um, a difficult uh, time where everything can be very confusing, uh, you know, uh, having that bond with another person or, or another family uh, can mean the world. Uh, so mm -hmm. it's, it's really important and, and we're definitely excited to, uh, to work with you on that. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I think it's so important that we all support one another. So I would yeah. love to be able to do that. So uh, what spurred your desire to have St. Jude recognized as a VHL uh, clinical care center? And, and why is St. Jude such a special place? Well, I'm going to be completely honest with you that had it not been for Kelsey Marks, who was um, a former employee at St. Jude and a colleague, I would never have known about VHL clinical care centers. You know, I hate to say that, but Kelsey brought this to my attention. And if it weren't for Kelsey and for Gina Nuccio, the genetic counselor who um, was previously interviewed by you, um, without their help and dedication, you know, we would never have been able to have submit, submitted, you know, this successful application. So I'm so grateful to the two of them for doing that. And I learned so much about the VHLA and um, about clinical care centers. 
I think it's important that uh, St. Jude become, or that it became a clinical care center uh, for a couple of different reasons. Um, one of the most important being that, you know, we want to be able to serve as a resource for patients and families in the Mid-South. Uh, right now, there's not a whole lot of um, other centers in the area that necessarily operate in the area of cancer predisposition um, or VHL. And we want to be a place where families and patients and providers can turn to for help. And certainly we're gonna to turn to you <laughs> for guidance in areas where, where we don't know the answers. So we definitely wanna make ourselves available to families and providers in the area. Now, you know, St. Jude, is a, a, a very special place for, for many reasons. And I know that, you know, Gina went through the history of St. Jude during her interview, um, but I'm going to reiterate a couple of the points. Um, so for patients and families, I think St. Jude values the patient and family experience above all else. Patients who are accepted for treatment at St. Jude never have to pay for their care, um, which is, you know, a model like none other. Um, and Danny Thomas was so forward thinking when he came up with this um, as a way that St. Jude would operate. And, you know, it's a miracle to me that a hospital can function like this, but it really is special. And, you know, it's special because it gives families the opportunity to focus on, you know, the care of their child. They don't have to worry about the bills while they're trying to take care of their child. Um, and that is so meaningful. And then for families who, who need help with transportation and meals, you know, and housing, those are also provided for free. So I think that is one aspect of St. Jude that makes it so special. I think for people like me, <laughs> clinicians and clinician researchers, St. Jude is clearly special because it, first of all, it cares about research above all else. Um, it's St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. And you might say, well, why, you know, why is that important? Well, we're never going to advance clinical care if we don't do research and don't understand more about the causes of cancer, um, how to best integrate new treatments into to patient management, you know, how to follow patients over the long term for potential side effects and, and minimize them in the future. So research is absolutely essential. And St. Jude provides to us um, as clinician researchers, the financial resources and the infrastructure to do the research that we need to try to push the boundaries of cure. And, you know, for me as, as a pediatric oncologist, I moved to St. Jude six years ago and I was provided the resources to, you know, develop a wonderful cancer predisposition team. You know, I have a, a great team now of five genetic counselors, a nurse practitioner, um, a psychologist, a social worker, a nurse, a nurse coordinator, and a nice research team. And, you know, we have all dedicated ourselves to trying to develop the best possible program for our patients and their families. And, Honestly, over six years, I've been able to accomplish here what it took me over a decade or longer to accomplish at you know, other institutions. So I feel um, that there are many special things about St. Jude that um, can help us to further advance the care for families with um, genetic conditions like VHL. So I hope that as a clinical care center, we can work closely with you and with families in the Mid-South. Absolutely. Yeah. What do you think uh, the state of VHL will look like in 10 to 15 years, especially for young patients today? Well, you know, knowing how far we've come over the last 10 to 20 years, I know that we will only be further along in the future. Um, my hope is that um, by studying the best ways to monitor, maybe the best ways to educate, um, by understanding how VHL affects different molecular pathways that cause cancer. I mean, we're, we're only going to be able to improve kind of testing, monitoring, and treatment of, of patients with cancer. Um, I, actually, what my hope is, you know, this is, a, this is a glass half full. This is what motivates me really is, I mean, my whole goal in going into cancer predisposition was so that we could take the knowledge that we learn and be able to develop a magic 
bullet that would prevent cancers from happening. Now, whether, you know, there will be a drug or a procedure, you know, that will prevent cancers in the next 10 to 15 years, you know, that's probably too high a bar to set. But my hope is that in the future, you know, that is eventually what will happen. Right now, we're in a place where we're getting better at testing. You know, I'd like to make that more available to everyone. We're getting better at understanding how different changes in the gene, you know, impact its function. We know that some gene changes aren't VHL, don't mean VHL, and some do. Um, and, and we're getting better at knowing how to monitor. But in the future, I really want to get better at treating and preventing the cancers. So I hope that that will become a reality for, for young people nowadays, so that when they're my age, maybe they won't have to worry so much about developing tumors. Wouldn't that be a miracle? That would be nice. <laughs> it would be uh, <laughs> wonderful. Something yeah. that uh, you and a whole lot of other people are, are, are working hard and, and, and praying for. So. Yeah, so I, I know we've gotten to know you a little bit uh, uh, in, in the hospital, but what other passions or hobbies do you have outside of the hospital? <laughs> oh, let's see. Um, well, I will say the coronavirus, while it's kind of had a negative impact in terms of activities, has allowed me to re-explore things that I haven't had the chance to do for a long time. Um, so I used to like to cook and then I became too busy with my job. <laughs> and so my husband took over that um, arena, believe it or not. But now um, I've started to cook some more, um, which is good. My son, actually, I have a son who's 16. He'd be terribly embarrassed if he heard this. But, you know, when he was a young child, all he ate were 10 things, you know, chicken tenders and pizza and so on. But now his um, palate has expanded tremendously. So, you know, he provides me with a menu of things that he would like me to make him um, each night. So I've learned how to cook again, which is nice. Um, and then the other, you know, the other hobby that I have actually is I, I love to um, bike. I like to do road biking and I don't know why, maybe it stems from having ridden horses as a child, but I love, um, you know, going out on the bike and touring. And that's how my husband and I first met. We actually did several organized bike tours through Southern France and Northern Spain and through the canyons out West. And then I had kids and had 18 years of inactivity. <laughs> and I decided a year ago that I was going to get back in shape. And actually coronavirus has allowed me um, a little more flexibility with my schedule. And so I um, I'm pleased to announce that um, since June, my husband and I have biked close to 2,000 miles. And my hope is that um, maybe by next year, this time I'll be able to ride a century. So, you know, I'd love to do a hundred mile ride, whether I'll make it or not, I don't know, but that's one of my favorite hobbies now, so. Wow, that is incredible, good luck. <laughs> I hope I make it. <laughs> well, uh, it. It sounds like you will, but that is amazing. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, so if you could give uh, young people with VHL and their parents one piece of advice, what would it be? Well, this may have been said in prior interviews, I'm not sure, but you know, it is my personal belief that um, knowledge is power, right? Um, learning about your disease is really important. Don't be afraid to ask questions. While it might seem you know, scary or intimidating at first to learn about it, I mean, for the parents out there, you know, you are the best advocate for your children, for the young adults and the adult patients out there, you are the best advocate for yourself. There are a lot of providers out there who don't know about VHL, unfortunately. And unfortunately, it is the onus upon you and people like me, you know, to educate your providers. So I think, um, it's really important to, to learn as much as you can about the disease. I also think it's important to follow through with um, monitoring because while monitoring won't prevent tumors from occurring, they will allow you to pick them up sooner, which will enable you to treat them more readily, more safely, and with fewer side effects. So, Try to, you know, take the knowledge um, and, you know, use, use it to your benefit. Now, at the same time, right, it's very important not to let VHL define you, nor for any genetic condition to, to define one, because, you know, to be honest, we all have genetic conditions. Some of us just know what they are and, and others don't know what they are. We all have genetic changes one from the next. So, 
my hope is that um, by taking the information, um, you can only build upon it to make yourself a stronger and healthier person and, and live a long and wonderful life. That's, that's great advice, thank you. Yeah. We have a, a couple of questions uh, from the live audience. Um, mm -hmm. uh, this question uh, you kind of just already answered, but uh, how important is surveillance for children and young adults with VHL? Oh, surveillance is, is very important. Um, we know that patients with VHL you know, are at increased risk for developing different types of tumors in different organs, you know, ranges from the brain and spinal cord to the kidneys and so on. And, um, you know, the earlier you detect a tumor, as I just said, the earlier it is that you can hopefully treat that tumor. So remove it. And um, sometimes the larger a tumor, the more challenging it becomes to remove. And, and also it can cause more side effects with removal or, you know, surgery or other types of treatments. So I think surveillance is, is very, very important. Uh, the next question we have, um, I know that Gina talked about this a little bit last time, but uh, what is the catchment area uh, for yeah. St. Jude? Yeah. That's a very important point um, for people to understand, um, and especially as it relates to our um, clinical care center. So because, you know, St. Jude was um, formed in a way where patients who are accepted for treatment are provided free care, I mean, there are limitations on the, the, the patients that can be, can be treated here. You know, we can't treat everyone. Resources are not without boundaries. So right now, anyone living within the St. Jude catchment area, which is a 180 mile radius of St. Jude. So that's gonna be part of West Tennessee, Arkansas, Mississippi. You know, those patients can be accepted for treatment at St. Jude, you know, regardless of their cancer type, for example, or their genetic condition. If you live outside of the St. Jude catchment area, you can be accepted for treatment at St. Jude, provided that there's a treatment protocol, a research protocol, I should say, in place for your specific condition. And patients who are uh, from in or outside the catchment area, you know, can be um, referred to our referral office, you know, where this information is, is reviewed and um, then decisions can be made. But just so you understand, it's a 180 mile radius where we're freely available to take care of patients. Um, outside of that, there are some extra considerations. Thank you for clarifying that. Oh, the other thing, if you don't mind, Josh, I should clarify. Sure. And, and people might understand this, but I mean, St. Jude is unique compared to other hospitals in that it focuses primarily on um, childhood cancer, disorders of the blood, so non-malignant disorders, sickle cell anemia, for example, coagulation defects, and um, infectious diseases, for example, like HIV. So we're not a general pediatric hospital in the sense that, you know, we don't take care of patients with kidney diseases, um, lung diseases, you know, those are managed by the pediatric hospital that's about a mile and a half, two miles away. So just so people understand, it is a, it's a, a unique hospital. So if you live within the catchment area, you can come here if you have, you know, cancer, a disorder of the blood, a genetic predisposition or an infectious disease. Thank you. Um, there's a question, I'm not sure if this is uh, specific to uh, adult patients or pediatric patients, but um, uh, do you, are you aware of any evidence of uh, there being uh, benefits to uh, CBD use uh, in cancer patients? Well, that's a good question. To be honest, I'm, I'm not so familiar with that area and I would need to do a little research. Um, I mean, not that, I'm a, not that I know of, but I haven't looked into it recently. I don't think that there would necessarily be any harm, but is there a benefit? Um, I'm not sure yet. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Nichols, I know I said this to Gina a few weeks ago, but I think it's worth repeating. It's obvious that what makes St. Jude's such a special place are the amazing and caring people there like yourself. Uh, your parent, your patients and the entire VHL community are lucky to have such a knowledgeable, experienced and caring team at St. Jude. Uh, once again, thank you for taking the time to join us today, as well as for everything you do for your patients and the VHL community. 
Well, thank you, Josh. And I so look forward to working with you and all your colleagues at the VHL Alliance moving forward. This will be a tremendous opportunity for us here at St. Jude. Thank you, we feel the same. Okay. And um, for everybody watching at home, you can learn more about the VHL Clinical Care Center at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital by going to vhl.org slash St. Jude. That's vhl.org slash S-T-J-U-D-E. We hope you will join us for future events, including future CCC Spotlight sessions with other medical providers from VHL clinical care centers from around the world. Until next time, stay safe. And Dr. Nichols, thanks again. Thank you so much, Josh. <laughs>